Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome, good afternoon everyone. I'm Judith Shankman, the Regional Director for American Friends of Hebrew University in Chicago in the Midwest. We are really excited to be here today for our presentation of What Does It Take to Be a Champion? How an orthopedic surgeon, an acclaimed author, an Olympic athlete, an entrepreneur and scientist, and a world-renowned university and researcher rose to the top of their respective fields. So um, what we're really excited to share with you is how um, this incredible program today and these four talented and accomplished panelists whose achievements span a wide range and, and how they have grown and, and achieved great things. But before we get started, I'd like to um, mention that at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A box, and we'll be able to take um, some questions at the end of the program. So I hope you will um, feel free to add, add uh, questions that we can address. Um, now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's program, Dan Schlesinger. Um, Dan has long been involved with the Hebrew University and AFHU. He attended the Hebrew University a few years ago as a student um, his junior year uh, in college, and he currently serves as the chairperson of the university's Board of Governors. In his professional life, he is an attorney and a partner at JSIC PC, a Chicago law firm, and his practice focuses on business insurance recovery litigation. So please welcome Dan and our panelists, and we are so happy you're here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, and hello, everyone. It's great to see you all virtually, and I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, we all know the saying, no pain, no gain. We all know the saying, no pain, no gain, and each of us knows that we must work long and hard to achieve any worthwhile goal that we must stretch ourselves beyond what we thought possible. We must take risks to achieve excellence. But the question is, what is the proper balance? What risks are reasonable? And what risks are foolhardy? What is the mix of physical strength, intelligence, and endurance that makes a winner? And what challenges await us in our pursuit of excellence? You know that Hebrew University and AFHU are the perfect hosts for a discussion of pursuing excellence. Hebrew University is respected throughout the world for its groundbreaking research and state-of-the-art innovation and for doing more with less. The Hebrew University is one of Israel's oldest institutions of higher learning, having been founded in 1918, some 30 years before <clears throat> the establishment of the State of Israel. The American Friends of the Hebrew University was founded shortly thereafter. And for nearly a century, AFHU has offered our American Friends an opportunity to support and promote the interests of the Hebrew University and the prosperity and security of Israel. So with that introduction, let's get started by introducing our distinguished panel. <clears throat> First, please welcome Professor Isaiah Shai Arkin. Shai is the Arthur Lewa Professor of Structural Biochemistry at the Hebrew University. And as the former Vice President for Research and Development, he can share some instructive insights into the search for excellence. Next, please welcome Dr. Michael Lewis. Michael is an orthopedic surgeon and former orthopedic consultant to the Chicago Bulls and the Chicago White Sox. He's the author of the recently published The Balls in Your Court, a doctor shares life lessons from Michael Jordan, Phil Jackson, Abraham Maslow, and other inspiring teachers. Welcome, Michael. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Chandler Robinson. Chandler is an MD, MBA, MSc, and a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Chandler, I have always believed that serial entrepreneur means you've been an entrepreneur many times rather than that you produce cornflakes. <laughs> Um, he's the co-founder of Monopar Therapeutics, a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company focused on developing proprietary therapeutics designed to extend life or improve the quality of life for cancer patients. <clears throat> In addition to, a noted, to being a noted science entrepreneur, Chandler is a member of the board of our Midwest region of AFHU. And last, but certainly not least, please welcome Emery Lehman. Emery is an Olympic speed skater who was a member of Team USA 
at the 2014 Sochi and 2018 Pyeongchang Olympics. Emery recently graduated from Marquette University with a degree in civil engineering and will soon begin studying for a master's degree in structural engineering at Johns Hopkins. I'm assuming that you can do studying for a structural engineering degree remotely, Emery. Good luck with that. All while training with Team USA in Utah and looking forward to the 2022 Beijing Olympics. With that uh, introduction of our illustrious panelists, let's begin with a question for Professor Arkin. Shai, tell us, how does your pursuit of excellence relate to the current coronavirus research that's being conducted and led to a large degree at Hebrew University? Well, I think what we do is we look both forward and backward. And we always need to remember that the Hebrew University was established to provide the medical, scientific, cultural, and technological underpinning of the emerging nation. And yes, today our academic fruits are shared with the entire world. We always remember our founder's goal. So if a major US university were to disappear, and coming from Yale, my hopes have always been for Harvard to endure that fate, seriously, little would happen to the US. But if the Hebrew University were to disappear, something like a third of all scientific, medical, and technological advances of the state of Israel were to disappear. So we need to remember that while we're trying to combat this problem. Now, coming from a small nation, we can't just do what everybody else is doing, maybe a bit to the right, a bit to the left. We need to think outside of the box. And the video that you see in back of me is actually what we're trying to do in my laboratory. We are trying to, believe it or not, cure COVID-19 that is currently hampering bacteria, not necessarily people. So we are trying to do an entirely different approach to find a cure for this disease, not necessarily by trying to cure people, but to see how bacteria respond to that. And I'm just one of these examples of numerous researchers in the university that are doing things very, very differently because coming from a small nation with tremendous responsibility, that's our only course of action. Thank you, Shai. Um, Dr. Lewis, let's turn to you. As an orthopedic surgeon who's worked extensively with elite athletes in your work with the Chicago Bulls and the Chicago White Sox, what are the risks that uh, you and your athletes have taken in pursuit of excellence? And what kind of rewards have you seen from those risks? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, Athletes that I've uh, worked with aren't necessarily, the most successful athletes aren't necessarily the ones who've taken the greatest risks. They're the ones who work the hardest. Michael Jordan, the best basketball player that I worked with, and Carlton Fisk, the best baseball player, literally outworked uh, all of their teammates. As far as uh, my own risks, the biggest risk is that I could do everything right in treating a patient, but the results might not work out well. And I learned many lessons from this gentleman, from Michael Jordan, and one of them uh, applied. Uh, there was a game in, uh, during the playoffs in uh, May of 1998, where Michael Jordan went up for a rebound and was poked in the eye and blood started pouring out of that uh, of his eyelid. So as we were walking off the court, I had a decision to make. Do I suture the eyelid, which would have meant uh, it would have closed, the wound would have closed, but he wouldn't have been able to come back? Or do I stary strip the wound, which would have meant he could come back to the game, but it could have come open and bleeding could have occurred again? So in my mind's eye, I saw the headline uh, in the Tribune the next day, Bulls lose playoff, Michael Lewis drops the ball. So uh, fortunately, uh, I chose to uh, stary strip the wound and uh, held my breath for the rest of the game and the stary strips held. But it was a real lesson in humility uh, and I felt very fortunate because I could have done everything right and the results might not have worked out well. As far as uh, rewards, 
I am incredibly blessed to be an orthopedic surgeon because not only do I see immediate tangible results, if a hip joint is worn out, I can replace it, but I get extraordinary letters from patients saying, you're a miracle worker, uh, you've given me my life back, and uh, those rewards are not hard to take. Thanks, that's a fascinating story. <clears throat> um, Chandler, let's turn to you. Um, you're an entrepreneur who's started several successful businesses. What have you learned along the way that's helped propel you to the top? There are two that come to mind that I'd like to highlight. The first is that it's important to be coachable. I think this, uh, I, I mean, I think I, I part of this echo what Michael had said. Um, you know, the second is creating a positive supportive environment where your thinking is anything can be achieved. Um, for the first point, I'd say no matter what your position or role is, even if you're the CEO of a company, you need to be able to learn and adapt, not just on your own, but also from others. Um, one of the best ways to achieve your highest potential, I feel, is working with and learning from those that are brighter than you are and to seek advice from those that have a lot more experience than you have. And one of the key things this will do is it'll help you to avoid making avoidable, avoidable mistakes. Um, and as Michael had pointed out, a trait that's crucial in achieving um, really your highest potential, I would say is that trait of humility, as he had mentioned. It's important to not let pride get in your way. I, I feel a lot of times I've seen where <clears throat> that trait where, where pride comes out, uh, it can actually make you less coachable um, and actually hinder you from achieving your, your greatest potential. Um, you know, it can cause people to think that they know better than everybody else or you know, they have the best solution when in reality, oftentimes I find it's, it's really working with and learning from those that are much more um, you know, bright and more experienced than I am that uh, I've often arrived at the, the best solutions to whatever uh, issues or problems that I'm, I'm facing. And then for the second point, I feel like a lot of times with some of my past experiences, I, I found that really the biggest limitation could have been myself. There might be people that would say, oh, that can't be achieved or that's, that, that's not possible. But I've worked really hard to create a very positive, supportive environment where even when those thoughts come to mind, it's this feeling of, no, I can do this. I can achieve this. There's nothing that's not possible. And no matter how high the highs or low the lows, it's, you know, I believe in what I'm working on. I, I enjoy the people I'm working with and, 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 and I'm trying to make a positive impact. I, you know, I can do this. I can get through this. Whatever the, the, the hurdles that are in front of me, I think it's that feeling and that environment that's positive, encouraging, and, and that, that, that belief that anything is achievable. Um, and so I'd say those are the two uh, you know, that I would like to highlight in, you know, um, to your question. Thanks very much. Um, Emery, turning to you, uh, someone who's an elite athlete at the highest levels, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of sacrifices you've had to make and the work you've put in in your pursuit of uh, elite excellence? Yeah, of course. Um, well, I guess from my perspective, I really wouldn't consider them, you know, sacrifices as much as just necessary things that I need to do to get, achieve my goal. You know, it's the same as in school, you know, studying for a test. It's not a sacrifice. It's just something that has to be done in order to, pre to prepare for the exam. But <clears throat> if we're calling them uh, sacrifices, I know that my mom had to probably sacrifice a lot more because in high school, um, I definitely certainly didn't live a normal high schooler's life. Um, you know, I grew up in Oak Park. Illinois, which is about an hour and 45 minutes to the closest long trek uh, speed skating oval. So my mom would drive me three or four times a week up there just to, you know, skate for an hour, two hours. And then on top of that, I'd skate short track and hockey. And then in the spring was lacrosse and baseball. So I just really kept myself busy. But as the training started to ramp up, um, you know, I was skating like 13 days a week, putting in these long hours all while I was going to high school or going to college and all these things. Um, but, you know, I really enjoy it. And I think that the process of putting in that hard work, like Dr. Lewis had mentioned, you know, I 
not the smartest kid, not the most athletic, most athletic kid, but I certainly do like to work hard and I pride myself on that. Um, and so, you know, I, I thrive on being busy and having a lot on my plate. So these sacrifices and these stressful situations are, I think, really what I, uh, what I thrive on. And then other sacrifices is, you know, a lot of spent a lot of time away from family and friends, which has really, you know, made me cherish the moments I do get with them. But, you know, once the season starts, like, for instance, now with COVID and everything, you know, we really can't travel. We can't go out to eat. We can't see friends, stuff like that. But then, you know, once the season rolls around, you know, we spend pretty much every major holiday from fall until spring on the road at competitions. You know, I've spent like more Thanksgivings in Russia the last four or six years than I have in Oak Park with my own family, which is always tough. But again, it's just something that's necessary that I need to be, that needs to be done in order for me to reach my goals. So I'm, you know, in the end of the day, I'm, I'm very okay with it. Um, but in terms of hard work, you know, we, we put in long hours on the bike and long hours on the ice and in the weight room, we do all sorts of training just to shave off a few tenths of a second here or there, which is, you know, in the end, that's the most satisfying thing. But to me also like putting in that hard work and, uh, putting in those long hours are the things I'm going to remember more than, you know, the race where I took a few tenths off. I think all that hard work, knowing what I did in the back of my mind is a very satisfying feeling. And especially in speed skating, it's a, it's a really tough sport because one, because, you know, people only care about speed skating every four years at the Olympics. And so it's mainly, you know, we do a lot of speed skaters do it for the pursuit of personal, you know, greatness, but also like i I, like I said, I like to work hard. I like to compete and a lot of long track speed skating is just competing against yourself. You know, you're trying to beat your own best time. You're, you're trying to skate faster than you've ever skated. So um, it's, it's definitely fun. It's definitely a lot of sacrifices and a lot of hard work, but I do, I do really enjoy it. Yeah. Well, you, you started off by saying you don't really think of it as a sacrifice. That sounded like an awful lot of sacrifice to me. Let me, let me change the focus a little bit. Um, each of you has outside pursuits that you engage in uh, aside from, from your main focus. Do you feel that uh, having more rounding in your life contributes to uh, the status of being a champion? Let me address that to the panel as a whole. Well, I'll take the question. Uh, I would echo first what uh, Chandler said, which is uh, the attitude that you can accomplish something. And one thing I learned from my passion about travel and photography is that there's often more than one right answer to a problem. These are some images I took in Namibia in Southern Africa. So this is one right answer. These are the tallest dunes in the world. This is an image from an airplane. Uh, the next image is one that was taken after climbing to the top of a dune at the very moment of daybreak. Another right answer. Uh, the next image is one down at uh, ground level. And then the final image is one taken stepping even further back from, from the perspective of this dried up lake. So all were right answers, different answers. So the, the idea that there's more than one way to solve a problem has been very helpful to me. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Go ahead, Shai. A stab at that one as well. Uh, I'm an experimentalist. And while it might sound trivial, most of us don't recognize the fact that you don't actually know the outcome of an experiment because if you did, it wouldn't be an experiment. And more often than not, experiments fail. And it takes a pretty long time to recognize the fact that most of your experiments will fail. And often it's advantageous for you to be able, let's say, to go out to a run, which you probably sympathize with me, uh, Daniel, about that, or to do something completely different, to shift gears in order to think about, you know, what kind of experiment can I do? What sort of tweaks can I do in order to get it to work? So I completely agree with you that having a pastime, having something that 
will be able to reset your thinking for a while is very, very advantageous for being an experimentalist and to try to be as productive and positive about what you're doing. Yeah, and I, I could add on to that from, I also feel like it helps you ask the right questions, uh, you, whether it's an experiment you're trying to design or you're trying to answer some, some problem or issue or challenge. I feel like having those different passions, backgrounds, experiences helps you to, by getting to the right answer, you're asking the right questions to get to the right answer. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, for me, my passion I learned through different experiences working at an investment bank, going to medical school, running a healthcare clinic, uh, starting a nonprofit. Um, all these ended up being in the science, medical, or business space. And interestingly, through these different experiences and passions I pursued, it resulted in the thing I most enjoyed, which was biotech, which is the combination of medicine, science, and business. And so now every day I get to combine these different, what once were individual passions into something that combines all of them on a daily basis, which every day I get to wake up excited about what I do. I was at the office until midnight last night. Yeah, you know, I love this stuff. It's, it's, it's my, you know, I enjoy it. And I think having those passions and, and pursuing them can actually make you more effective at what you do. It's fascinating. Emery, I'll give you a chance to throw in the last word on this question before we move on to the next one. No, I was just kind of piggyback with, off what everyone has kind of said at this point. But yeah, just keeping well-rounded. And I know that I have, for instance, I've always competed, uh, usually skating my best while I'm in school, which what I would think would uh, be contradictory because I'd be more stressed out or maybe spreading, you know, all my priorities too thin. But it actually, I think when my mind's busy in other areas and focusing on other things and I'm learning how to problem solve and things like that, it actually benefits, you know, all areas of my life. Great. Um, I, I'm hesitant to ask this question because you're all so accomplished at what you do. It's hard to conceive that you've ever had any uh, bad experiences as you've been on your, your path to success. But let me ask the question uh, and see if you can surprise us with some answers. Um, have you had experiences while you were pursuing your goals that made you question whether you were doing the right thing and uh, made you rethink what you're doing? And how did that come into play in, in getting you to where you are, if in fact that happened? Um, I failed a lot, so I can lead off on this one. Um, I, after I made my first Olympic team, I actually got uh, mono. And I was really sick for four years and I wasn't able to, or not four, sorry, like two years um, of bouncing back from that. And for like six months of those, I really couldn't train and, you know, funding from the USFC got cut and all these things happened. So I really felt at rock bottom. And for those next two seasons leading up to the Olympics, which are obviously the two most important seasons, you know, every race, I, you know, stepped the line and I was like, oh, I, you know, I don't know how this is going to go. We'll see what happens. And more often than not, those two years, the races were, you know, pretty bad. And I was skating slower at, you know, 20 years old than I was at 15, 16 years old. And that was really discouraging and tough, a tough uh, pill to swallow. But um, like I said, you just kept putting in that hard work, knowing that, you know, there, I am going to get past this. There is going to be, you know, light at the end of the tunnel and, uh, I'm really, really glad I stuck with it because now that I'm healthy and strong again, things are, things are going well. That's great. Uh, great to I'll hear. I'll take a stab. Uh, how much time do you have for me to discuss my failures and mistakes? <laughs> uh, we assume you can do that in 30 seconds, Michael. Uh, the, uh, I would say that during my orthopedic training, uh, every week we would have a conference where we would discuss our mistakes and what we could have done better. So it was very good le uh, learning experience to learn to acknowledge your mistakes, take responsibility for your mistakes, learn from them and not repeat them. Uh, as far as how to handle adversity, uh, I was very inspired from this man, uh, Bill Winnington, who injured his uh, foot just before the playoffs in 1997 and I had to tell him that he couldn't participate in the playoffs. Naturally, he was upset, but he said, 
I've been very fortunate in my career. I've had a good run. I've been in the league for 10 years. Most people are only in the league for three or four years. Uh, and it was just a beautiful example to me of how to handle adversity. What's important is not how you handle things when things are going well, but how you overcome adversity. And an example that Emery alluded to was this figure skater, Shizuki Arakawa, who won the gold medal in figure skating in 2008. And it was estimated during her many years of training that she fell 20,000 times. But what's important is that she got up 20,000 times. So how you deal with failure, how you overcome failure, how, as Shai said, you uh, you work in the lab for years, and as Chandler said, you can not come up with the right answer, so you just uh, you keep trying. Yeah, that, that actually fits with, uh, that made me think of one of my failures that ended up ultimately working out. I had an idea for the very first endeavor I ever pursued. It was a nonprofit, and I believe deeply in the concept, the idea, and what I was working on. Um, I was an undergraduate at Northwestern. My idea got shot down five times over the course of six months by Northwestern. So I went to University of Chicago and I convinced them to give me $5,000 and they did. And then immediately Northwestern gave me $5,000 and then AbbVie gave me, and Baxter gave me 5,000, AbbVie gave, and, and all of a sudden it all ended up coming together after, after months of feeling like a complete failure, the idea, you're know, questioning whether it was worthwhile you know, now it's 16 years later and it was a phenomenal success. Um, it also makes me think of another experience more recently, which was um, end of last year, where this endeavor I believe, believe in tremendously. I get to work with people I love working with on you know, something I strongly believe in and where we're trying to make a very positive impact. And, and you think, okay, you know, you'd hope everything would go well. We're planning to IPO, it's October. And two days before our IPO date to price it, the market crashes. The Dow goes down a thousand points. The bankers pulled the IPO. Other IPOs got pulled. They told me, you have to wait at least a year. This is just the protocol for companies going public. You have to you know, basically go back, you know, hide in your shadow for a year and come back and try and reemerge to IPO. And you, know, you get faced with this situation. Do you, do you, you know, I, I think a lot of emotions around pride come into place. And that's why I was thinking you know, my early reply on pride. Um, I, I decided to learn all the rules around IPO. So I learned you know, the SEC rules, FINRA, um, you're trying to learn the rules of NASDAQ and actually put together the IPO, the investors, everything, and handed it to the investment bankers. And then you just hope and pray that, you know, the next day when the IPO opens up, it, 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 you know, flat at best, you know, just, okay, I got it done. I didn't have to wait a year. And the irony was as, as terrified as I was the next day it opened up and it ended up being the best performing IPO of the entire last decade. Um, it was one of those things where you went from feeling like a c complete failure to a, one of the highest highs I've, I've ever experienced. Um, but it was such a stark contrast to literally the day before feeling like I was, I was failing. Maybe I can take a stab as well. In science, if you're succeeding all the time, if you're doing the obvious, you're actually failing because you're not trying to be sufficiently innovative. And again, the entire thing about doing science is doing something that no one has thought before. So when I joined the Hebrew University in the year 2000, I had this long-term plan, several years, uh, of what I'm going to do. And that's the sort of thing that you need to provide the university for them to realize that, you know, you actually have uh, an original, original plan. And the year 2003 came and the winter of 2003 came and suddenly there's this new disease called SARS that has hit Southeast Asia. And then I realized very uh, quickly that I'm going to entirely abandon everything that I sought out to do. And while initially I thought, you know, would this be perceived as a failure? And then I realized, I don't care. I don't care. I want to do interesting stuff. I want to make an impact. And if I failed by doing uh, something completely different, so be it. And I think I haven't regretted that. 
But at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's how science is. You, it's very difficult to predict what you're gonna be able to do as long as what you are trying to do is doing it the best possible level. That's great, thank you, Shai. Uh, let me ask a question that uh, may be a little unusual and perhaps a little unfair, but for, for those of us who really uh, don't have any ch chance of rising to the pinnacles that you have, that are, are not cut out to be champions, but who still want to better our lives and be more successful, is there any tip you have for us about how we can go about pursuing our personal and professional goals, even with the realization that we're never gonna be at the very top? Huh. Anyone well, who wants to take a shot at that? Uh, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, the, uh, I think a crisis brings out the very best in people. And, uh, and one of my rules uh, is performing acts of kindness without any expectation of anything in return. And uh, one very inspiring example for me is uh, uh, Jeffrey Tabin, who is a uh, professor of ophthalmology at Stanford, who goes all over the world performing cataract surgery. And this is uh, when my wife and I visited him in Ghana. And for $25 an eye, he can take someone who's been blind for years and suddenly restore their sight. It is absolutely uh, miraculous. And all of the profits from my book uh, go to the Himalayan Cataract Project. This is someone who was blind for years. And this image is the, the very moment when he could see uh, for the first time. So uh, this is a time uh, of the uh, pandemic that we're in where each of us can, can, can do better. We can say, what can I do to, to uh, make the world better? We can set higher goals for us uh, each day. Thanks, Michael. Anyone else have anything to add? I think I can say a word or two at least about what is the underlying uh, thinking in the university about, you know, how can we maintain excellence? So I think it's, believe it or not, it's quite simple. What you need to do is you need to recognize, appreciate, and nurture excellence. And by that, I mean, for example, don't focus on any particular field. For example, if you're the head of the Institute of Chemistry, don't necessarily go out to search for the best inorganic analytical chemist. If one of those have, has just retired, simply get the best chemist. Because if there's one thing that is absolutely certain is that amazing people will continue to do amazing things. If you hire someone or focus on something that is currently trendy, it may stop being trendy in the next years to come. And you're going to be stuck with someone who's the world's expert in a field that is not necessarily that attractive. But in the Hebrew University, what we focused on first and foremost, again, we never have a call for, you know, inorganic analytical chemists. We have a call for just a chemist, a historian, as someone in comparative literature, as broad as possible, because we want to ensure that we get the best possible individual rather than someone that just fits a particular niche. Thanks, Shai. <clears throat> uh, Chandler, Emery, any, anything you want to say? If not, I will move on to another question. Uh, and this is my last question before we turn to uh, the, the Q&A session for the audience. Um, and this is simply, has, how has what you've learned in your pursuit of excellence contributed to your personal philosophy and outlook on life? I, I can try and answer that. I, for me, it, it, for many, many years, it's always trying to focus on enjoying people I really enjoy working with on endeavors I strongly believe in and where I'm trying to make a positive impact. And if I'm doing those three things, Regardless, whether it's nonprofit, for-profit, I find it to be the most 
fulfilling and enjoyable experiences I've had to date. I mean, that's sort of been a guiding principle for me, trying to have those three things line up. Um, you know, we spend so much time working on our passions and interests and, per, you know, in pursuing them that I, I think it's extremely important to have those, those three components line up. Just to echo something that Chandler said uh, uh, earlier uh, about surrounding yourself with people who are uh, smarter than you are, although I doubt that that happens with Chandler, uh, but it certainly happens uh, with me. I'm frequently surrounded by people who are much smarter and more talented. And what has helped me is just grit, persistence. Uh, if I can't outsmart people, I can at least uh, outwork them. So that's something that's been very helpful for me. And I, I can add on to what Dr. Lewis and Chandler both said there, but uh, I know like in terms of my situation, you know, a lot of people want to skate fast at the Olympics, want a medal, but you know, a lot of people, you know, it's hard to wrap your head, head around, you know, skating a race four years, four years away. So I know that personally, you know, to cope with that, I've, you know, not only do I take it one season, one month, one week at a time, but I, you know, I'd really just take it like one, one work, not even one workout at a time, but like one, whatever I'm doing right there, whether it's, you know, a lift, a certain bike interval, whatever it is, you know, I just have that mindset of like, this is what I'm doing now. It's, you know, it's setting me up for what my future goals are, but all that matters is that I get this done right here, right now. And whatever, you know, whatever my next set is, whatever my afternoon workout is, whatever tomorrow is like, that doesn't matter. Like, just have to get through what I'm doing right now, right here. And that, that has really helped me out. Cause I, I'm someone who can really get wrapped up in, Oh my God, like, how am I going to skate so fast? You know, at the Olympics four years from now, like uh, things like that. So, you know, just being for me personally in here in the now focusing on what I'm currently doing, you know, not two minutes ahead, but what I'm doing right now um, has really helped me. Maybe I can add a, a sentence or two. Uh, and please forgive me for sounding like a politician because I'm going to say two things that might sound contradictory. So on the one hand, I'm a huge believer that it's great to think long term, to have this very long term project. Uh, I want to figure out how viruses infect us and so forth. And on the other hand, I love the saying from Pasteur, luck favors the prepared mind. And by that, I mean, in science, if you stumble on something, it looks very interesting. Don't fear abandoning, you know, your major thrust and pursuing that because that might actually it turn out to be even more interesting than what you set out to. Because at the end of the day, it's so difficult to actually set a plan, a course of action for 30 years. So um, always keep your mind open, but it's great to look at the long term as well. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you all for your patience in responding to my questions and for your great comments. At this point, I think uh, Judith Shankman has been collecting some questions in the Q&A box. Um, and Judith, you want to throw a few, few of those out? Absolutely. Um, so this question is for Emery and Chandler. And it is, how are you coping with the restrictions on travel, playing, training with other athletes and socializing um, and older family members at this time, given the, the pandemic? Um, I could go first. Um, so we, since I'm training on the national team out here in Utah, they have special restrictions on what we are allowed to do. So um, if we're seeing anyone outside of who's on our team, which is very rarely, it's always social distance, wear a mask. We have to wear masks at all times inside the rink while we skate, while we bike, while we run. So they hold us, they're holding us to a little bit of a higher standard, but uh, we're fortunate with long track speed skating that it's an individual, even though you're on a team, it's an individual sport. So at the end of the day, you're gonna be racing alone. So we've actually, I think I've benefited from needing to get in that mental attitude of being alone, training alone, but also we've been uh, doing a really good job of social distancing, wearing masks, and really just not, not doing anything outside of just training and training, going to school and hanging out at home. 
it, for me, it's been similar. I haven't traveled since March, which is very unusual. I feel like once or twice. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I travel several times a month typically, and now I haven't for the, the past or, you know, several months since, um, since all this started with COVID. At the office, people wear masks. We do a lot of calls by Zoom. Only half the, the employees are actually at the office at any time. And so I'm actually not around individuals that, that frequently we have space on two floors in the building that, that we're in. And my interactions have been very limited. I've actually found it to be a very productive time. I've not minded it so much. I think Zoom has, has worked pretty well, keeping in touch with family and, and friends. And, and, and so I think it's helped make this moment in time much more bearable. Um, but I've also found it to be very enjoyable from a work perspective because without all that downtime, going to the airport, flying, you know, going to a hotel, you, know, you can get a lot more done. And so I, I found it a, just a, a, personally having that additional time for just learning new things, applying it, trying to move your endeavors forward more quickly. I, I, I've actually appreciate this 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 moment in time great great um the next question is for um shy dr arkin um you mentioned your work with covid19 so the question is how close do you think we are to a viable vaccine minus the russian research uh well very difficult to predict precisely. I'd be surprised if we see something uh, before this winter season, and I'd be uh, negatively <clears throat> surprised if we don't see something by the first or second quarter of 21. So I guess, you know, within the next half year or so, uh, we should probably expect something. Now, one word of caution, I don't know if most people recognize that, and I don't want to sound pessimistic, is that Vaccine development is very different from developing a regular um, medication because medications are normally given to sick people, but vaccines are given to healthy individuals. And because of that, the tolerance level for side effects is, is very important. And in addition to that, don't forget, we don't actually challenge the individuals which got vaccinated in these trials. Okay, so even if a vaccine is uh, brought to the market, we don't actually know at the end of the day with 100% certainty that it will be effective. Chances are that it would be, but again, this is not an insurance policy that you'd be able to go sue someone. Okay, so hang tight, right? <laughs> need to hang tight. Uh, next question is for Emery. Um, as a speed skater, how do you balance the risk of crashing and serious injury against the reward for faster time and victory? Um, well, I guess if you're doing everything right, you shouldn't be crashing or having any serious injury. But on the other hand, I actually have a athletic trainer I'm very close with who I worked with the past, I think this is our eighth year together in Milwaukee, or she's in Milwaukee. And so now we've been subject to just uh, FaceTime sessions, but we call it like prehab, um, just injury prevention work that I do, you know, three hours a week of just stability, core balance, things that will you know, we're on the ice, we're turning left all the time, we're hunched over, so we have really bad posture, like all these things that are, you know, not necessarily good for your body, but, you know, I balance it out, you know, doing this prehab, you know, keeping the core strong, Getting, make sure my, I'm balanced from left to right because obviously I only turn left. So there's a lot of things that uh, are leading to hip, knee, back uh, injuries. Um, but I do my best and I try and get on top of it before I get injured rather, rather than reacting to it, trying to be proactive about it, stay balanced and prevent those things. And then in terms of crashing, yeah, like I said, I... <laughs> As long as I'm skating well and skating, uh, staying strong, I, I, I should be able to avoid that. But uh, it, they do happen. And, uh, you know, we, I've learned over the last 15 years of speed skating, hopefully how to fall correctly. 
So th there is there is a way to fall correctly. So I've uh, I think I perfected that enough as a little kid, and hopefully I uh, still have that in the back of my mind. That's great. Be careful. We're, we're rooting for you. Um, this question is for all the panelists. Um, they, the person wants to know, and actually it's a really, I think a great question to talk about balance because you all are clearly top in your fields. Um, and I think, how do you balance that? What personal practice do you use? Whether it's me meditation, visualization, can you share a story um, that draws a connection between your practice and your performance and outcomes? I think it's interesting. Well, I'll uh, give one response. Uh, I find that uh, the other activities actually make, and this is alluded to earlier, uh, especially by Shai, uh, uh, actually all of the panelists, about other activities br making you bring more energy into your primary activity. For example, travel uh, enables me to understand people from different uh, countries and religions and political viewpoints. So when, with my patients from all over the world, uh, I have a deeper connection with them and they uh, hopefully feel that. So uh, meditation certainly helps, but uh, all of the activities, tennis in my case and uh, and uh, the travel and photography uh, makes, it brings more to the table and makes, uh, uh, m brings more energy to the main occupation of orthopedic surgery. Well, I, I mean, I feel slightly uncomfortable saying this, but at the end of the day, my true priority is family. So if I ever want to get perspective on failure at work or that sort of thing, I go back home and I recognize that hopefully my wife still loves me the same way as do my kids. And I mean, Dan, you're smiling because you're, you were fortunate enough to beat my far better half, but I'm serious. You, you rely upon your true source of strength. That's a good practice. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, on top of what Dr. Lewis and Mark had said, I, um, for skating, obviously we do a lot of, visualization. I'd like to do a lot of, I watched hours and hours of video of myself on one screen and then the best skater in the world right next to it and just, you know, point out what's, what's different, what's not different. And then of course, you know, when I'm sitting in my hotel before races, you know, always visualizing myself, putting myself at the line, um, you know, I, in my mind or in visualization, I've been, I've done more races in my head than I have on the ice. Um, and then, like uh, like Shai said, at the end of the day, it's just speed skating. It's just a race. So, you know, I don't train with, oh, it's just a sport. It's just a race. But, you know, at the end of the day, if I have a horrible race, it is, you know, it is just a sport. I know that there's life beyond that, but I do, I do take that very, very seriously, obviously. But at the end of the day, it is, it is just a, it's just a sport. Chandler, do you have anything to add? I, I was just thinking of even yesterday around 9 30 p.m. I was hitting a wall and I actually you know to, to Michael's con I shifted gears and went to the gym in the basement of our office building and jumped on the bike for 50 minutes and I was able to read the documents I needed to read and to have a clear mind it just energized me I mean I think I identified a lot with with what Michael was saying um, I think there's a lot of truth to that and that's something that that a practice I've employed myself as well Thank you. So I have one more question. Um, and if, if any of you want to answer it, it's, it's a little more personal too. But the question is, who in your life um, has inspired you to achieve great things? So if anyone wants to chime in, this will be our final uh, question. Well, I'll throw in a, a, a thought. Uh, I think in our society, mentors are enormously underappreciated. And I have had so many mentors, starting with my parents. And uh, I am so blessed that I have a 103-year-old mother who's the most uh, amazing, inspiring person that I know. Uh, but I've had many 
mentors, Abraham Maslow in, uh, in college, uh, Sir John Charnley in orthopedic surgery. Uh, I've just been so blessed with, uh, with finding mentors. I can add a, a short personal story. When I was a grad student at Yale, I had two supervisors. One of them was uh, uh, you know, far more senior. He actually became the Dean of Yale College at the time. And the other was a junior faculty member. And I would meet with him every two, three weeks to share my uh, results. And I recall one thing uh, as vividly as if it was this morning. At the end of the meeting, uh, the young uh, faculty member basically said, well, look, I need to go back to work. And the senior faculty member says, no, 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 you're missing the point exactly. This is work. So listening to what your grad student, and I've taken that to heart, and mm -hmm. I've basically viewed that individual, which I'm very happy to say his name was Don Engelman, still is, uh, as a mentor, and to try to follow in his footsteps. I've had very many teachers and athletes that I've looked up to, uh, but no one greater than I, I, as cliche as it might be, than my brother. He's always been smarter, more athletic, and all these things. So I've spent my whole life trying to compete against him, and he's, you know, been a great, he's a great guy and everything like that. But you know, I spent my whole life competing against him and trying to, you know, beat him in school, beat him in sports. And so that, that's probably been my, my biggest mentor. Great. Okay. Chan I, I, think, yeah. I mean, okay. for, for me, unquestionably, it would be my parents. Um, I think from early on, they created that atmosphere I was describing of that anything's achievable, very positive, no matter how low the low or high the high, they are always very balanced, measured, and we're supportive and encouraging. Even when, you know, I, I probably should have been yelled at. They, they Instead, they'd say, thank goodness, you know, you're okay, or thank goodness. And so I think they really gave me a lot of um, freedom, latitude, and support to make decisions that didn't always make sense to others, but they were supportive and encouraging. And ultimately, it, it came into really you're working in the biopharma space where I got to combine these fairly disparate interests in medicine, science, and business. Um, and then also just some fantastic mentors as I did find that area I wanted to get into. There were some, some really legends in the industry like Roy Vagelos who took the time when I knew nothing to really sit down with me for two to three hours at a time and grill me, challenge me, introduce me to other leaders in the industry to learn from them. And, and, and so I, I think um, you're know, really sort of the combination of, of incredible parents and then also mentors to help along the way, just consistent. Even our, the current chairman of our company, the co-founder, Chris Starr, I mean, he's got a track record similar to Roy Vagelos and I get to work with him and talk with him every day and learn. That's what I'm saying, learning from people that are better and brighter than you are. I, I get to do that on a daily basis and it's, it's been absolutely incredible. Could I just add one person? In high school, uh, I had a debate teacher named Molly Martin who taught me uh, the importance of looking at both sides of a question. And especially in this day of fake news, being able to see someone else's perspective is especially important. Judith, are we, uh, we done? And if you want to close in comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, well, actually, before I, I thank everyone, let me, Dr. Lewis, let me ask you one quick question, um, which I guess relates to championship, which is uh, many of us had the experience recently of, of watching the, uh, the Last Dance, the ESPN special about the Chicago Bulls teams of the 90s, those championship teams. Just uh, what was it like for for you reliving that and was that authentic to you? Well, it was a wonderful nostalgia trip uh, reminding us of the magic of that time. Uh, my one criticism was that it was unfair to Jerry Krause, the general manager, who was brilliant in his own way, 
but uh, was a public relations uh, nightmare. But uh, one very quick story that's, that uh, echoes a lot of what we've been saying in this hour is that one time he was on his way to the airport during a playoff game. And I asked him, uh, I said, Jerry, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Europe to scout a player. I said, Jerry, it's the playoffs. Why don't you just watch a tape? And he said, I want to see his body language while he's on the bench. And to me, that was a very profound lesson of perfectionism, of, of grit, of going the extra mile, uh, which is, uh, or it, you know, as Shai said, when something comes along, you respond to it. Uh, so that was a very powerful lesson that the last dance reminded me of. Thank you. Uh, great to hear that personal recollection. Um, <clears throat> at this point, I think we're uh, ready to close the meeting. I'd like to thank everyone for being with us and particularly thank our, our panelists, Professor Shai Arkin, Dr. Michael Lewis, Dr. Chandler Robinson, and Olympian Emery Lehman. <clears throat> Today, we've learned that each one of our guests is an outstanding individual, a risk taker, a leader in his chosen field, a maverick in pursuit of excellence, but we've also learned that each one of them had help and encouragement from others. We do need each other to succeed. <clears throat> Even the most talented individual cannot go it alone, and here's the pitch, neither can Hebrew University. I encourage all of you to visit afhu.org to learn more about how AFHU supports the Hebrew University, about our upcoming programs and how you can get involved. And that brings us to the end of today's discussion. I hope you've learned something that will encourage each of you to step outside of your comfort zone, to take a risk and to strive for excellence. Thank you all. Uh, and thanks of course, always to our brilliant AFHU staff, in this case, the Midwest region staff, particularly Michelle and Judith. Um, thanks very much. Bye everyone.